Hello everyone, my name is Loco and welcome to the second episode of StarCraft 2 Strategy where we're gonna talk about in-depth things and we're gonna go for high-level play and we're gonna take a look at really details and all that kind of jazz. Today we are going to talk about this subject called thinking. Now this is, this is probably one of the most underrated subjects that you can ever hear me talk about because Whenever you see pro players play and whenever you hear commentators commentate, you always hear them talk about build orders and certain strategies and uh, maybe timing pushes and all that kind of stuff. But it's one thing that they barely ever talk about and it's going to be thinking. Now thinking is something that mostly happens during the game and after the game, or before the game and after the game and not so much during the game. Uh, because obviously it requires a lot of brain power to think about certain things. Now in this game, or in this episode, we are going to go over a few short examples on how we can apply thinking and how we can actually change our game up, considering what we scout and how we can improve our game pretty damn fast, but just simply opening up replays and thinking what we could have done better. Now, in this very first example game, um, we are going to take a look at a game that we uh, saw at DreamHack a few, I believe it's two weeks back right now. It's going to be Jadong versus an unknown Zerg player. Now, the unknown Zerg player, let me check his name really quickly. Uh, his name is Saril, and I actually checked him up before this episode and the guy is actually a rank uh, 50 Grandmaster currently on the European ladder so definitely like the guy is definitely not a bad player whatsoever but because of outthinking and because of you know Jadong being really really smart versus a relatively unknown player he will be able to get a relatively easy win so let's hop into the game so here we are in the game I'm just going to cruise through this one in the top left corner of Rowind we have Saril spawning as a red zerk and his opponent like I mentioned Jadong is going to spawn as a blue zerk in the bottom right corner now um, like I mentioned we are going to think about all some things during this episode and we are gonna think about what Jadong might have been thinking about um, <laughs> before he started this game and how he got such an easy win. So what's happening? Well he's just scouting around, he notices, okay his opponent is cross position, his opponent, you know, since he is cross position it's really hard to scout whatever is going on and there we go, Zerkling's running across the map and all of a sudden several GG'd. So yeah, that was a really quick, easy win for Jadong, and even though considering his opponent was top 50 Grandmaster on the European server, and there was really no way that there were a preparation made uh, against this player, Jadong still managed to pick up a really, really easy win. Now, how did this one happen? Let's have a really in-depth look. So here we are once again into the game. Now, this time around, we are not going to play it as fast. Still gonna speed it up to times two right now though. Um, but um, it's going to be a whirlwind, a big ass four player map. Now, what do we know about four player maps? Well, people will pretty much 100% of the time scout with their overlords, especially in Zerg vs Zerg, scout the nearby positions first. Just because, you know, the chance is bigger that your opponent, or the chance is equal that your opponent might be there. So you might as well send it away to the cross or to the close positions and just wait uh, with Zerglings until you can scout cross positions. Now in this specific game, Jadong does pretty much the same thing. Now he is already opening up with a gas into a spawning pool. Why? This was a really old build that was popular way back when the game first came out um, and you still see it sometimes and as you can see in this game it did pay off for Jadong. Now Jadong is just going to go for an expansion, just an extremely standard play which was normal a while back. Now he notices Oh, my opponent is not scouting me with overlords at all. At this point, he meets the first overlord of his opponent right here. Let's have a look at it. Oh. Come on. Yes, there we go. So... At this point, he, he realizes where his opponent scouted, right? He noticed, okay, this overlord came from the top left corner. Now, at this point... There's really two options that he can go for. Obviously, he is thinking about this, right? He's like, okay, I'm going to go for either Zerglings or I'm going to go for a lot of drones. Those are the two options that he can go for. Now, let's see what he does. So, Jadong is just happily making um, more drones for the time being right now. Um, he's getting Zergni speed, he's getting a queen up, he's actually uh, going to inject with the queen and walk it to the natural. And what he decides to do is incredibly smart. He's thinking right now. My opponent has no overlord in the middle of the map. There's just no way about it. There's just no possibility um, that he has an overlord across the map. Jadong is also sending his first set of Zerglings across the map to checking out what is going on. He realized nothing weird is going on for my opponent. My opponent just went for a standard opener in Zerg vs Zerg. So I know where his Zerglings are at right now as well. So what just Jadon J do right here? You could already see them sneaking by. Let's back up a little bit. What he decides to do is actually move Zerglings past any kind of overload position, past any kind of watchtower vision because he knows exactly where his opponent is at. And therefore he has a really easy time to run by his opponent 
who has absolutely nothing to prepare for this sort of a thing. Now keep in mind, the opponent is still top level or top 50 Grandmaster, and Jae Dong, by simply outthinking his opponent, got an easy round on the Queen, managed to get a whole lot of Zerglings into the base of his opponent right now, and he's already picking up a win at the 5 minute and 45 second mark, which is incredibly quick, but it's all done by simply outthinking his opponent. Now, you might consider this being a little bit cheesy, right? Come on, Jado, you know better than that, right? But no, really, when you think about it, it is absolutely incredibly smart what Jadon was doing in this game. He went into this game, he was prepared, uh, he knew that it was going to be a four-player map, and he also knew that if his opponent was going to be cross-position, there was absolutely no way that he could spot a Zergling run by coming in, especially when you open up with a quick Zergling speed, it's going to come completely unexpected. Now, this is something that you can easily apply into your own game. Whenever you go into a game, you can think about, okay, this is this map, if my opponent is going to be close air position, I can um, I can do strategy number X. But if my opponent is going to be cross position, this strategy will be horrible because the, the flight path for my mutalisk or whatever is going to be much longer. Those are the things that you really want to start working on as much as you possibly can. Now... Um, there are two points really to this sort of thing. First of all, it's whenever you go into a game and you already have a strategy planned, like this was the case with Jadon. However, there's also another part in which you need to think really hard, which mostly happens after the game. It's going to be all about scouting and it's going to be all about uh, knowing what your opponent is up to. So let's have a look at this game. So the first example I'm going to give you is a game that we already took a look at at the uh, in the first episode of StarCraft 2 Strategy. It's actually a Zerg vs. Tyrant between Sword of and Cass. Um, it's going to be a Zerg vs. Tyrant, obviously, because we love them Zerg. And that's this point, um, which we discussed as well in depth in that video, um, where we go ahead and check out with an Overlord what is going on in the Tyrant main base. Now, this is going to be absolutely crucial to the strategy, but it's once again going to be really, really important that you think about all the things that your opponent could be going for so this is going to be the magic one the magic overlord that is going to give us all the information that we need um it's six and a half minutes this thing happened right now what he decides to do well it actually is a little bit later in this game but what he decides to do is fly in this overlord and what could he be possibly seeing? This is a Zerg vs. Tyrant example on where you need to think really hard. And you need to think about what could my opponent be possibly going for. Now I can give you a few examples, but I really want you to think about this uh, for a second just by yourself. Like whenever you lose a game of Zerg vs. Tyrant, realize what you could have scouted. And realize what your opponent could have been thinking about. And why he was going for a certain strategy. In this situation, in Zerg vs. Tyrant, there are a few different openers that can go for, that they can go for um so first of all there's obviously a quick third command center second of all there's going to be big hellion pushes um and third of all there's going to be like a quick stim pack play which is going to be um which is going to be the, the strategy of choice this time around for Kess, but there is a whole bunch of strategies um, that Terran players can go for. Now, whenever you fly in an overload and whenever you scout something like this, think really hard what your opponent is doing. And this is not something that you want to do during the game, this is something that you do after the game. So after the game, maybe you lost to a Stimpak timing push, you want to be loading up the game, you want to be checking out your scout timings and think really hard how you could have stopped it and when you should have stopped making drones. Now, there's another example that we can take a look at in Zerg vs. Protoss as well. So this time around, we are going to take a look at a Zerg vs. Protoss. Once again, going to be Jadong. This time, it's going to be versus a, a relatively well-known Protoss player. It's going to be Ferdy, I believe. That's how you pronounce his nickname, or Ferdy. I'm not completely certain on that, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this time around, we are going to take a look at Cybernetic Squad timings and think about the different strategies that they can go for. Now, in this specific game, uh, Ferdy is actually going for a relatively quick Cybernetic score. He's opening up with a pylon into a gap into a gateway or a gateway into a gas rather and then a second pylon and a second gas and then he throws down the cybernetic core now let's take a look at when this thing finishes it's gonna be three minutes and 40 seconds exactly when the cybernetic score finishes in this specific game now this is another game once again from a protos versus zerg it's gonna be mc this time around playing instead and mc is going for a pylon on the low ground followed up by a forge followed up by a nexus followed up by a photon cannon and then he throws down the gateway and then eventually when this thing finally finishes up he starts a cybernetic score which is to finish at ba -ba -da 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 -da. bam five minutes and 50 seconds now what does this mean why am i showing you this 
What happens whenever your Protoss opponent goes for a certain strategy or a certain build order is that there's different timings involved every single time. In this specific games, in these two specific games, we actually saw a difference in cybernetic score timing that is almost two complete minutes of difference, which is gigantic. Whenever you're playing a game, two minutes of time is a huge difference. Now, why are we looking at the cybernetic score? Well, the cybernetic score opens up pretty much all the attack ways uh, that a Protoss player can go for. So let's say they want to go for a gateway all in, the cybernetic score is going to be there for that. Uh, let's say they want to be going for robotics, they will need the cybernetic score. Same goes for Stargate, Templar, all the kind of stuff that a Protoss can do comes out of the cybernetic score. Now, whenever you scout your Protoss opponent and you see this, this setup and you see the timing of the cybernetic score, what you want to be thinking about really hard is what could my opponent be possibly going for? Because in one game, which is a pro gamer as well, the cybernetic score is two minutes earlier than in the other game where we see SKMC who is obviously, you know, he's the most earned player of all time I believe, um, who is obviously a pro gamer as well and there's two complete minutes between those two build orders. Now obviously by one there's a nexus down, by the other there's not. But there is a lot of thought that you can do right now and that there's um, a lot of different strategies that open up but all the timings change. And whenever you scout your opponent and whenever you notice what your opponent is up to, you either are thinking right at that moment in the game, what could my opponent be doing? Or if you decide to lose to that one, well I guess that's somewhat of a decision, but if you lose to that one, you're gonna open up the replay, check out what you could have done better in this situation, scout better next time and realize and recognize what your opponent is going for. Now obviously cybernetic scores and um, overlord scouts in Zerg vs. Titan are really just examples. There's gas scouts, there's, um, you know, you can check out where the chrono boost is getting spent in Zerg vs. Protoss. Uh, you can check out um, the quick third CC in Zerg vs. Titan. You can check out the third and fourth gas guys in Zerg vs. Zerg on certain maps. You know, there's a whole, bot whole bunch of things that you can check out and it's really important that you put a lot of thought into that and you can do that previous to the or um, before you actual open up the game or you can do it after the game uh, where you start thinking really hard about what your opponent could be going for i want to thank you guys all for watching hopefully you enjoyed this episode of starcraft 2 strategy if you did go leave a thumbs up in the description below or well in the in the above the description below you can also leave a comment i read every single comment and i would love to and always if you really enjoy the content you can actually subscribe if you want to see more. I want to thank you guys all for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile. And hopefully, I will see you in the next episode of StarCraft 2 Strategy. Bye! And before he saw any kind of Hellbats, he was already defended versus. Now, it turns out he actually does not make them blindly at all. Because in the other two games, he does not opt to go for blindly.